Uh, afternoon all. Um, I thought today I'd come along and talk about one of the projects that we've recently been involved with at Becker. Uh, for those who don't know the name, we're a reasonably significant multi multidisciplinary consultancy based in New Zealand. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about Te Papa Museum, which is our national museum uh, located down in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, some of you may have seen the Seen, seen Wellington in the, in the media in the last few days. Uh, we had a, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Um, fortunately, I think everybody, certainly my family and friends, are all okay, and it seems to have had minimal damage. Um, so I thought I'd talk today a little bit about how um, fire engineering and how we look at buildings has changed. The building was designed about 20 years ago, a design and built 20 years ago, um, and the fire engineering environment that we work in has changed a lot in that time. Uh, Te Papa has about uh, five hectares or, or 12 acres of floor space, uh, mostly occupied by um, exhibition space and function centres, um, and that spans over about six floors of the building. Um, all floors of the building are connected by uh, a number of large atria, um, making the building a single compartment. Uh, we've got no fire separations or smoke separations um, between floors, um, so fire in any one part of the building is going to have an impact on a lot of other areas. And that makes it challenging for us in a, in a fire engineering perspective. Um, largely the way the fire engineering philosophy for the building is approached is with a, a significant smoke control system. Um, we've got about eight different smoke extract systems in the building, extracting something in the region of 300 cubic metres a second of, of air out of the building, depending on the location of the fire. Uh, the building is also equipped with uh, a number of, with, with, sorry, an automatic sprinkler system um, and smoke, uh, smoke, uh, smoke detection throughout. I thought I'd talk first a little about the, the building code and the changes and, and where our, our regulatory environment has, has gone. Um, because that does reflect on, on what we're able to assess from a fire engineering perspective now and, and 20 years ago. Um, when the building was designed, the only regulatory documents available um, in the New Zealand environment was this acceptable solution document. Um, acceptable solution, a deemed to satisfy approach. Um, for those from the UK, something like the approved document B. Basically, you've got this many people, have that number of escape routes, make them this wide. You follow a cookbook sort of solution and you have a safe and compliant building. Those sorts of approaches don't typically work well with multi-storey atria buildings. Um, and because of that, an alternate, solu uh, alternate solution approach was taken around these large atria. Together with the regulatory authority, the designers sat down and sort of agreed to two key criteria. One was, wherever we've got these large atria, they're going to have um, smoke extract systems. We're going to maintain a smoke layer height above where the occupants are and we're going to maintain that smoke layer height indefinitely. Essentially, we're going to maintain tenability within the building indefinitely. Um, secondly, we can't have people sort of traipsing around the building forever. We're going to say the building has to be evacuated in 10 minutes or less. So two criteria, we're going to assess them in isolation and they're completely different. These days things have changed a lot. Um, over the past few years, New Zealand has switched from an objectives-based building code to a performance-based building code. Um, for instance, our tenability criteria, a few years ago, the, the building code may have said something like, make sure you can get everybody out of the building safely. Now it says things like, occupants must have greater than 10 metres of visibility um, for the period that they're evacuating. So it's very standardised and driven. Um, from a, a compliance document approach, we now have the verification, this, this document here, verification method CVM2. This is a performance-based modelling framework. Um, things like our challenging fires, we don't argue about what they're going to look like and what's the appropriate fire. Uh, this document specifies those. So we know that it specifies things like our fire, our fire growth rate, um, how, the, how the fire is going to be, the heat release rate will be affected by the activation of sprinklers, um, how fast are occupants going to, going to move and, and flow through doors and, and such things. Um, so it's a very different environment. We're no longer looking at uh, evacuation and smoke control in isolation. We're going to combine, combine the two. We're going to look at, for each, each location within the building, we're going to compare 
what's the available safe egress time versus the required safe egress time. Um, and so you can play the two off against each other. Engineering tools have changed a lot in the last 20 years as well. Um, CFD modeling was just sort of starting to come into the market when the building was designed. Uh, but for the, this building was simply cost prohibitive. Um, and so zone modeling was used. Fire Simulator was, was the, the, the chosen software, um, which is a single room zone model. Um, in terms of evacuation modeling, EvacNet Plus was used. It's a nodal evacuation model. So we're going to take our building and we're going to translate that into a number of rooms or nodes, and how, do those, how are those connected by paths or staircases, corridors, and the like. Uh, and to see sort of how fast can the building be evacuated. These days we've got a lot more choice. Uh, CFD analysis is far more available, a lot cheaper, um, and we can do Pathfinder evacuation modeling, agent-based evacuation modeling. Um, to build the 3D models, um, for instance, we, we, we actually decided to use Revit, it's uh, produced by Autodesk, it's a, a CAD software for those who are not familiar with it. Um, we find it's a lot cheaper to pass off the um, building the models, building the 3D geometry off to the, uh, the drafters, um, the architects who can do it a lot more efficiently than we can and at a lower cost rate. We then import those models, those 3D models into our fire software, into our egress software. Um, within Pyrosim, for instance, we weren't just modeling a single room of the building like, was, like what was possible in the days of Fire Simulator. We were actually able to model the entire building and all of the systems within it. Um, so we could, we could model each of those eight different smoke extract systems and their individual smoke detection triggers. And then when it came to reviewing the results, um, compared to 20 years ago when your results were a numerical based output, we still have that numeric based output, but we also have, we can visually review our results. We've got things like smoke, smoke view, and we can look at, at Revit, uh, sorry, we can look at Pathfinder and see where the people are moving, where are our queuing points and our bottlenecks. So if we look at what we had 20 years ago and we look at what we've got now, there's a huge difference. Arguably, we can get a better understanding of the building, but is it a good thing or are we just adding unnecessary, unnecessary complexity? Are we just sort of spending more of the client's money and not really producing a benefit? What are the benefits? I'll touch on a couple of case studies, a couple of examples um, here. There's a few more covered in the paper, um, but we'll keep it fairly brief for this. If we consider a fire um, in our entrance atrium, so as you walk into Te Papa, you are greeted by this four-story atrium. It goes about 22 metres high, and it connects four different stories of the building. Uh, the fire protection systems here basically um, include a smoke extract system on the ceiling that extracts about 100 cubic metres a second, um, sprinklers on the roof, uh, spring, but being 20 metres up, they're going to take a long, long time to, to activate. And so we've got, uh, smoke uh, sorry, we've got flame detection activating a deluge system, a deluge sprinkler system. So how was that design reached? <coughs> Given that fire simulator is a single room zone model, we can, they could only look at one small part of the building. They can only look at what's happening in the entrance atrium alone. We can't, they couldn't see what effects that might have on other areas of the building, you're sort of restricted. We're going to put an extract system into the building, they say. Okay, well, how big do you size the fire? Let's put in a deluge system so we know that we can control the fire to a limited size, say four megawatts. As I mentioned before, the design criteria called for a maintained layer height above where the people were. So let's say the highest occupied floor is 16 metres, at a couple of metres, to two, uh, two metres, so we're going to say people's head height is maybe 18 metres. Um, add a safety factor again, and we're going to design for a smoke layer height of 20 metres. Sounds great. Um, extract system added to the building to cope with that, to maintain that layer height, and make up here applied as well, uh, make up here put in down the bottom. When we came to reassess the building, um, we didn't necessarily agree that the fire under the atrium itself was going to be the most challenging. Under our modelling framework, um, the design fires, when the sprinkler system activates, we say that caps the heat release rate. It's going to control the, it's going to control the fire, stop it from growing larger. In this case, we've got flame detectors in the atrium. Um, those are going to activate relatively quickly. 
the sprinklers, will, the deluge system will come on, we're going to have a pretty small fire. What was probably more of a challenge to this design was a fire in the gift shop on the ground floor. Uh, if we have a fire there, it's not necessarily going to be a four megawatt fire, it's going to be a bit smaller than that, but we're going to have the spill plume, and we know that spill plumes give us a bit more entrainment. Um, and more entrainment means more smoke, we may fail tenability. So that's exactly what we did. We ran up an FDS model of the building, um, and we showed that the fire was going to be capped at about 1.5 megawatts, so quite a bit smaller than the original 4 megawatt design fire. We had our spool plume rising up through the, through the atrium, um, and what we found was tenability was failing. On the upper floors of the building, visibility was falling below 10 metres, and therefore people could get lost. So why is that? Well, we know that spill plumes generally have more entrainment than an axisymmetric plume. That might be one part. But was there more to it? So we went in and started visually interrogating the results. Um, these are a couple of uh, images of a slice file taken through the entrance atrium. Um, the blue being stagnant air, the green, um, yellow, red being the, fast, being the, the air of high velocity. In the image on the left, you can see the spill plume rising in, the gr in green. And the image on the right is the same image, sort of 30 seconds on in the model, uh, once the extract system had fired up and ramped up to speed. What we found is that makeup here was being drawn in through the front entrance of the museum at about five metres a second. This makeup here was disturbing our spill plume and giving us a lot more entrainment. Once we realised this, we took another look at the makeup air systems in the building. Of the 20 odd makeup air vents, in the building, only three were programmed to open with a fire in the entrance atrium. Um, a quick change to the building management system, let's open all the makeup air vents, um, drops our makeup air velocity from five metres a second down to one metre a second. Rerunning that model, we're able to show that we no longer get that disturbance of the plume, we no longer get all that extra smoke production, um, and we're able to maintain visibility on the upper floors fairly well indefinitely. So a slight change in actually being able to see what's going on in more detail um, using CFD analysis, something that wasn't possible with the old zone models, um, and we're able to tweak the design to sort of improve, improve the performance of it. In terms of evacuation modelling, um, when the building was designed it was estimated that have roughly 4,000 4, visitors in the museum at any one time. They ran a model to say, well, let's say all the escape routes are open. Remember, we need to evacuate the building in under 10 minutes or 600 seconds. Um, and the model showed that, yes, the building could be evacuated in about 500 seconds. So it's a win, success. We came back and had a look in Pathfinder. Now, for one thing, we didn't have to guess the number of people in the building. We've got visitor number records for the last few years, and we know that we're probably never going to have more than about 3,000 people in the building. So let's say 3,500 to be on the, safe on the safe side. Our acceptance criteria is also changing. We no longer want to necessarily evacuate the building completely. Um, all we need to do is evacuate the people to a safe place, to a protected safe path, to another compartment, um, into the, the protected corridors. And we can do that in less than 500 seconds, in 460 seconds. What's interesting is that to actually evacuate the whole building takes longer. Um, than, than what the nodal model suggested. We're looking at 600 seconds instead. So what we're saying is, and before when we had 4,500 people, we could evacuate them in, in 500 seconds. Now that we have 3,500 people, we've got less people, but it's going to take us another 100 seconds to evacuate. So what's going on? Unfortunately, we don't have um, a lot of the inputs from the original design. Um, Documentation has a habit of being lost over time. Um, but looking at a few sort of possibilities, um, for example, if you take a, if you take a, you're doing a hand calculation for a single room, how long is it going to take to evacuate? If you say you've got two escape routes, two identical escape routes, you might say you're going to have a 50 50 split. Half the people go to each escape route. When we model them with, um, with Pathfinder, we see that doesn't necessarily happen. You might get a 60 40 split. A 60 -40 split. Um, agents prefer a, a particular escape route. Um, the modelling is by no means bulletproof. You've still got to review your own results and see what's going on. Um, 
in the red line, the red line, for instance, shows some of our, our early models had people evacuating from one end of the museum completely to the other corner of the museum and down another escape route. The escape route signage is never going to take them that way. So you've got to, you're still making approximations in the model. You're still guiding people and putting in particular controls within the model to try and take, send people in what you consider to be a realistic scenario. So it's not perfect, but it's probably a, lot, it's probably a bit better. Having done the CFD modelling um, for that, that ground floor, the gift shop fire on the ground floor, we know that the spill plume from that model is going is to rise up through the atrium and it's going um, to envelop a number of the bridge links across the atrium. Um, the smoke going across those bridges is likely to sort of, it's going to be a visual barrier for occupants uh, evacuating and they're not going to want to escape via the bridges. So we decided to look at a couple of blocked exit scenarios. Um, for instance, when we have that ground floor fire, that essentially cuts off all our bridges across the atrium. That isolates this entire west wing of the building, um, which has three floors of function space, about 1,400 people, with a single escape route to evacuate. Those people couldn't be evacuated in under 10 minutes. It's actually going to take double that. We're looking at a 20-minute evacuation time. So where does all this sort of leave us? If we look at our original acceptance criteria for the building, um, we said, well, the building needs to be, we need, the, the, the design needs to maintain tenability in the building indefinitely. It needs to hold the smoke layer above the occupants, um, full stop. What we know now is that it doesn't do that. Reviewing the results, in almost every fire scenario, tenability will fail in some occupied part of the building. We had uh, the design called for the building to be evacuated in under 10 minutes. We know that that doesn't necessarily happen. Depending on where the fire is and whether we're going to block escape routes or not, um, it could take twice that long. So we can't achieve that. But with a few small tweaks to the building, altering things like that make-up air, make air programming, um, we're still able to achieve compliance. We're still able to keep the building safe. We're not looking at the whole building and say, let's evacuate the entire building in 10 minutes. We're looking at parts of the building and, I, and, and reviewing them in isolation. We're, looking, we're saying, there's the fire in the middle of the building. We know that visibility around the fire is going to be lost very quickly. But the people can evacuate from that area similarly um, very quickly. They're going to be in another area of the building where they still have maintained tenability, where they can still get out of the building safely. So, in conclusion, if we look back to the modelling sort of 20 years ago, assessment was fairly limited. We couldn't assess the building, um, the, design, the designers couldn't assess the building in a lot of detail. And as a result, things like safety factors started to be applied. But these safety factors were applied without necessarily understanding all of the implications in the building. You say the makeup air velocity. We want the design. Yeah, if you if you go through literature, some some part, some um, documents will say let's have a, a makeup air velocity of one meter a second. Some say five meters a second. Um, but without actually modelling that, you don't necessarily understand what the impact of that is going to be, or where is that makeup air vent. So you have limited detail. You apply safety factors, and there's a risk that you're just shooting in the dark. You don't necessarily know that you're going to achieve what you want to achieve. When we look at the, at the building now, when we reassess it with modern tools, um, with more detail, with more complexity, we can get a better understanding of things. It's by no means a complete under, uh, understanding of everything that's going to happen in the building because we're not modelling hundreds of fires. We, we, we can only do so many. But we do get a, we do get a, a safer understanding of the building. I'm oh, sorry, a better understanding of the building. In a couple of years' time, as the museum's, uh, the museum's going to undergo a, a large-scale renewal. They're basically going to gut and redo um, all of the exhibitions within. And when they come to doing that, we now know exactly what... We, we understand the, the building and how smoke flows through it better. And we can guide how that's done. We know what we can tweak, what things we can tolerate, and what things we've got to push back on the architect and say, you just can't do that. We can make small changes to the building, and we can make it a safer building. Um, has anybody got any questions? Kevin. 
did the earthquake of, of 2011 change anything having to do with, uh, for example, the reliability of the power grid for the air handling systems? Or have there been any changes due to, to, due to earthquakes? Not so much in terms of the, the extract systems. Um, in this building in particular, we've got um, generator backup. They can pretty much run the building completely. Okay. Uh, this is one of the, um, what's it called? This is one of those buildings where if there is an earthquake and everything else gets knocked down, um, people will move into, into the museum and, and shelter there for as long as need be. Where we have seen changes come in following the, the 2011 Christchurch quakes, is a much greater emphasis on, on seismic design. Um, and what that means is we're putting, we're trying to account a lot more for the fact that your pipes, your ducts, your services in the building are going to move around when that building, um, when you have an earthquake. That started a, a bit of a debate between um, fire engineering and structures. Um, when we have a, a, a service passing through, through a, pen, a penetration in the wall, we want that penetration to be as small as possible and then we're going to seal it and stop the smoke moving through. From a seismic point of view, you want a big gap around that hole so that the pipe can move around and not sort of smash into things. And we've had a lot of arguments and I don't think that's been resolved yet. Okay. Um, right. it's, it's an interesting discussion that's ongoing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. Jeez. Appreciate it.